I V M. Why is Asia referred to as Monsoon Asia? What was the difference between shipbuilding in the Indian Ocean and shipbuilding elsewhere? Were the ships of colonial traders better than ours? How does technology affect the history of the seas? How does the history of the sea affect us all? Welcome to States of Anarchy, a podcast on global affairs and foreign policy. I'm your host Hamsini Hariharan. The seas make up the largest global commons that all of us share in. Much of our interactions on the global stage happen through the seas. The clothes you wear, the technology you use, sometimes even the food you eat and the books you read come from trade. 90% of global trade happens through the seas. Yet our histories are often national histories in which the seas are incidental elements. A couple of weeks ago on the first episode of States of Anarchy I had spoken to Sunil Amrit about the Bay of Bengal as a region. It gave me a new lens to look at the way the world works. My guest this week has also changed the way I look at the world. Lincoln Payne has written 5 books and countless other articles and essays and lectures on maritime history. He's even named his daughters after ships. We spoke about maritime history, particularly the history of Asia and how it's evolved. But before we dive into the conversation, let's take a short break. Hello everybody. Welcome to another awesome week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you are not following us on social media, please make sure that you do. We are IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. We'd like to thank the sponsors on our network, Storytel, Savari and Paytm Money for their support and really appreciate it. It's been a busy month at IVM. Last week we launched three new shows. We launched ATKT Talent Tent, we launched Business.next in partnership with Bloomberg Quint, and we launched Equity Sahi in partnership with Motilal Oswal. And this week we're going to bring back an old favorite. We're going to come back with the empowering series after a fairly long hiatus. I hope that you guys enjoy that. Life coach Zarina Punawala is joined by our co-founder Kavita Rajwade to discuss how you can put your game face on at your workplace. On Cyrus says media pioneer and first generation entrepreneur Rani Skruwala shares his journey with Cyrus from humble beginnings to small steps in business to going on to establish UTV RSVP and more. He also sheds light on his theater days, his parents and his new podcast the Rani Skruwala podcast right here on the IVM network. On Simplified, join Chuck Narayan and Shree Ket simplify the black holes and their importance in this universe. Vishwesh Guttal joins Pavan and Ganesh on Thale Harate a Kannada podcast to talk about his life as an associate professor at the Indian Institute of Science in Bengaluru. On the Pragati podcast, V Ravi Chandra joins host Pavan to share his experience of working with governments and sheds light on the challenges and constraints faced by government agencies, bureaucrats, and politicians. On Crock Tales, Anna narrates tales on the theme of Avengers Endgame. What would the Endgame be in a layman's life? On the Sponge Podcast, Ambi Parmeshwar talks about the importance of demonstrating a greater degree of trust in a client and agency relationship. On IVM Likes, Abbas and Abhijit are joined by the main cast of TVS new series Kota Factory. They give insights about the show and the inspirations of the writers and actors. On Echoes of India, Anirudh takes us on a tour through the ancient city of Ujjain, walking us through its sights and smells, and introducing us to some of its eccentric people. And with that, let's move on with the shows. Hi Lincoln, thank you for agreeing to speak with me. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. So when I was looking at your formidable research, the first thing that struck me was this quote on your site that said all history is maritime history. Can you explain that for me? Well, I think that all history is affected by what happens at sea and what people do on the sea. It's a bit of a challenge. but even today if you look at the way globalization works globalization is fundamentally a, a function of material exchange that happens by sea as we well know 90% of world trade is carried by sea and 95 to 99% of internet connections mm. between continents travels via cables laid on the seabed mm. so uh, maritime world has enormous influence on what we do and yet it remains invisible to most people i think it's that maritime history is largely ignored because of the way our modern states have evolved so you have histories that concentrate more on particular nations and their relations to the sea rather than looking at bodies of water by themselves is that what do you think of that well traditionally people looked at the real forerunners of maritime history or the people who promoted maritime history first were the british 
followed by the Americans. And this really sort of came to the fore in the late 19th century, uh, in part because you had the confluence of two things. One, uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan wrote The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, late 1800s. And shortly after that, Evans discovered Knossos. And the Minoan Empire has long been regarded as um, the first sort of thalassocracy, the first sea power. And I think these two things together uh, really sort of represent the birth of maritime history as a discipline. But it was very much influenced by concern and the interests of existing maritime powers. And in the last 25 to 30 years, and starting with Braudel, uh much earlier than that, but in the last 25 years or so, there's been a great deal of interest in developing histories of oceans, of seas, so not only the Mediterranean, but also the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Indian Ocean, the Baltic, the North Sea. Uh, as you look around, there are more and more books written that really try to organize the historiography around a body of water. We'll come back to Mahan later, but something that I was thinking about while you were speaking about this is maritime history is also um, the history of migration. It's the history because it goes back to, as you've said, in the Sea of Civilization, that when people started using the sea or water for travel, that is how they managed to discover new places and it is the birth of civilization itself. I wanted to actually go back a little earlier to... Um, Asia particularly, and something that we see with China becoming more and more of a superpower every day is uh, its new project that it calls the Maritime Silk Route. So could you tell me a little more about uh, Maritime Asia in the ancient period, the medieval period, how, how did it evolve? Well, one of the uh, earliest long-distance maritime exchanges that we know about on a sort of regular basis uh, took place between the Indus Valley Civilization Lua and Magan and Mesopotamia. So the, the Oman, the Persian Gulf, the island of Dilmun or Bahrain, and, um, the area of what's now Kuwait and southern, southern Iraq. So maritime exchange has been extremely important to the people living around the Indian Ocean and its tributary seas like the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. So as I said, that's really the oldest long distance trade that we know about. Um, and then somewhat later, you have the uh, spread of Hinduism to Southeast Asia, which was another very important episode. And we don't know the details of it that much, but we do we do know that that is how Hinduism spread. Mm -hmm. And whether this involved large-scale migration or small-scale migration or simply transplanted merchants who decided to stay where they were, whether they became rulers themselves or whether local rulers decided to convert to Hinduism because there was an opportunity involved in doing so. We're not sure about all of those details, but all of those are things that we do know. Those are possibilities based on evidence we have for other places and other times. So there has been a, a very rich maritime history of the Indian Ocean, but it's it's taken a long time for people to really become aware of it. And uh, why is this is something that has always struck me, but the monsoon winds have long been called for as something that's changed the way that Asia trades, that changes the way Asia interacted with the world. But why the monsoon winds? Why was it so important for Asia? Why was it called monsoon Asia in that sense? Well, it was important because it did two things. One was that it made a very sort of predictable season for exchange. Uh, the other thing is that it, it allowed for the first truly long-distance open sea trade. So you had people going from East Africa to India. You had people going across the Bay of Bengal from southern India to Southeast Asia. You had people going from Southeast Asia up to the Chinese coasts and to Japan. So these were enormous distances to be covered at a very, very early stage. Um, you know, the, not to belittle the Mediterranean, but what was happening in the Mediterranean was much shorter distances and involved people who were much closer together and who might have come together by other means. So you really have this incredible 
mixing of different cultures and different peoples and races and languages happening around the Indian Ocean and the, the monsoon seas of East Asia and Southeast Asia, which led to a much more varied trading world. This is something that I read in your book about shipbuilding in um, ancient and medieval periods in India. And something that I found very interesting was uh, what you said about horses. There were accounts of um, thousands of horses that uh, kingdoms had ordered at a point in time. But how were these ships even equipped to bring those horses in was the question that you'd ask. Well, I'm not sure of the details, but um, the evidence speaks to the, the, the evidence is abundant that this horse trade actually took place. And we know from other accounts elsewhere, the ancient Greeks and Romans traded elephants on the Red Sea and they built purpose built elephant carriers um, because they needed these for their, their war armies. And this was all part of the sort of um, post Alexandrian struggle for power, and the Seleucids had been trading overland with India, and they had gotten war elephants, and then the Ptolemies realized that, oh, they they needed elephants too, so they started getting them from Africa. And they, they were so successful that they kept sort of decimating the population, and they would have to go farther and farther and farther, and so they needed ships to bring them back. So the trade in large animals is uh, very old, and it's well attested in all sorts of different documentary, artistic, and other evidence. All right. And when we move into colonialism, the first accounts that you hear, at least in India, is that um, the Mughals were no match for the Europeans at sea. Most of the kingdoms in India were no match for um, Europeans because they had sea power behind them. What was so... Um, mighty about the Europeans? Um, was it their ships? Was it their ammunition? Um, what was different about the way they built ships? Well, they, they built ships. Um, the ships of the Indian Ocean tended to be built of sewn hull, so they would actually sew the planks together um, with cord. And ships in the European tradition at that period tended to be built, um, or mostly built, of wood with either iron or wooden nails. And so they were much more rigid, and they were able to carry heavy armament. And that was one advantage that they had. The other was that they were also very far from home and very desperate to, to win. And they had to win, otherwise they would die. And I think that that sort of gave them an ambition that uh, the people who were sort of on the defensive didn't have because, well, if the Portuguese are here, you could go somewhere else down the coast. They couldn't take over everything. They came pretty close, but the Portuguese really sort of became part of the fabric of Indian Ocean trade as much as they mm. overtook it. Fair enough. When you look at the origins of international law regarding the seas, all of it goes back to mostly Hugo Grotius. Um, could you tell me a little more about Hugo Grotius and the context in which he was writing and what he was writing? Grotius was a, a very young lawyer uh, who had commissioned by the Dutch East India Company to write up a justification, one of their captain's decision to seize a Portuguese ship off of what's basically now Singapore. And his defense was that although the, the popes in the 15th century divided the world unknown to Europeans between uh, Portugal and Spain, nobody else in Europe really saw the wisdom of that. And so he wrote up an argument that basically said the sea is open to everybody and, and everybody should be allowed to go trade wherever they want by sea. And this was a very noble argument, and it provided perfect justification for what the Dutch had done to the Portuguese in Southeast Asia. Shortly thereafter, the Dutch really established themselves with both feet in Southeast Asia, and they immediately reversed the idea of free trade, and they basically shut down the Portuguese. They threw them out of South Indonesia. Um, they also put limits on what and where Indonesian traders could go, and so they completely ignored Grotius's own advice. They were very supportive of the free sea in Europe because they were the principal carriers of European trade. So it, it was very opportunistic. 
True. And it's also a condition of the international system, which is anarchic, right? So because they have power, um, they're more free to do about it as it, they want to. Yes. Um, at this point, let's take a break. India's a massive subcontinent, home to truly stunning diversity. Behind the veils of smoke that obscure our thriving cities, our history is still alive, glimmering like sequins, waiting to be discovered. And if you, like me, are straining to hear the echoes of our past, this podcast is for you. I'm Anirudh Kanisetti, a history and geopolitics researcher, and I host Echoes of India, a history podcast about India, by Indians and for Indians. In Echoes, we journey through the complex histories of South Asia and what they can teach us about our globalized world. Tune in every Wednesday on ivmpodcast.com or your favorite podcast app. Welcome back to States of Anarchy. I'm Hamsini Hariharan and I'm in conversation with Lincoln Payne. What is Grotius's influence beyond that then on international law? Well, I mean, he's considered the, the father of modern international law and um, not just on the basis of the free sea, uh, but for his other writings as well. So he, he's a, a seminal character, but there's always been a tension between the idea of the free sea and its opposite, which is obviously the closed sea, mm-hmm. um, and the arguments uh, advanced in favor of the closed sea came very, very quickly. They were advanced mostly by a guy named John Selden, who was English, and he was supported by uh, King James, who came from Scotland and was following a tradition of the Scots, who basically said that they owned or controlled the sea out to about 28 miles. And that was because they were very anxious to control their fisheries. And many people actually thought that Grotius was writing about the North Sea fisheries because that was contested waters between the Dutch and the English. So people have always used the free sea or the closed sea argument to their advantage depending on what they needed. Mm. And uh, the Americans, for instance, are, you know, the ultimate free traders, but it was the Americans who, in, under uh, Harry Truman, came up with the exclusive economic zone mm. of 200 miles. And that was, you know, theoretically it was for oil exploration on the seabed and all the rest of it, but it becomes a bit dodgy when you start saying, well, but, but that's ours, but, but we still believe in the free sea. True. And the same thing is happening with China, isn't it? With EZs all over the world, there is a contestation of what is considered theirs, what is open, and so on. The South China Sea case is fascinating because, in fact, um, the person who, who came up with the sort of the nine dash line map uh, was actually a nationalist Chinese. And so long as the nationalist Chinese were claiming it in the 1950s or, or perhaps earlier, the Americans didn't have any problem with it because we were allied with the nationalist Chinese. And in the 1960s, of course, the mainland Chinese merchant marine was about 30 ships, if that. Um, but now that the uh, mainland Chinese have decided that they think that the Nine Dash Line is a very important and valid instrument, the Americans are going, no, 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 we should have been objecting to this all along. We just forgot or we overlooked it or whatever it was. So again, it's it's pure uh, geopolitical opportunism. True. And there's also um, a question of whether... History should be the basis for such a boundary, um, with a lot of people saying, uh, first, this may not have a lot of historical backing, and second, even if it did, so what? So what if uh, this was the thing? Yes, because people tend to, again, for partisan reasons, they can sort of, they can nudge history and their interpretation of actual events in, in various different directions. Mm-hmm. And so uh, at what point in history, which which stage of history are you talking about? Because certainly if you started saying, well, let's take the history of China in 1964, then they don't really have much claim to the South China Sea. But if you say, well, 1403 and 1405 with Zhang He, then, you know, then you have a more expansive view of, of what Chinese historically uh, can lay claim to. That's fair. Uh, 
something that I've also been thinking about is the way technology shapes the way in which our uh, nations evolve, in which our, uh, we evolve as people. How has technology shaped uh, maritime history in that sense? Well, um, technology is essential, obviously, to go to sea because you need boats. And um, you don't necessarily need huge boats to go great distances, but you need fairly large boats to go great distances in a reliable way and to create long-distance trade links. So the 15th century, when Europeans began their breakout from the Mediterranean and, and northern European waters, there was a great deal of um, technological influence in that. Uh, both in terms of the types of ships, the rigs that they had, and the navigational instruments that they developed. Um, more recently, the container revolution starting in the 1950s has been absolutely fundamental to reshaping the world. And it's both changed the way the world functions in very quantifiable ways, and it's also changed the way people perceive the importance of maritime activity. And because the numbers of people involved in maritime trade, shipbuilding, shipping, and uh, loading and unloading ships, has actually probably fallen in the last 50 or 60 years. At the same time, the volume of trade, international trade, has grown seven and a half times. And what's interesting about that growth rate is that in the same period, the world's population has only grown two and a half times. So that means that everybody on the earth, everybody has access to three times more stuff than they did 50 years ago. And as we know, there's a great deal of inequity in the distribution of wealth. So rich people have vastly more than three times more stuff than they did, and poor people still have pretty much nothing. So another important aspect of the container revolution and the distribution of wealth is uh, in the fact that there are about 5,000 ports in the world, and yet 40 ports handle 60% of the container traffic in the world. And where are these 40 ports? Well, they're in China, they're in Europe, they're in South America, they're in North America, they're in, in, in India. What this means is that essentially... People talk about the one percenters and the one percent of the population that controls 60 percent of the world's wealth. Well, one percent of the world's ports control 60 percent of the world's trade. And so you have this structural inequity that is going to be impossible to, to reverse um, and is probably only going to intensify. And this, I think, is going to have an enormous impact on, on future developments uh, politically, geo, uh, strategically, economically, demographically, because these ports are magnets for not only material goods and people, but also for culture, for religion, for art, for all sorts of different, for education, uh, medical care, all sorts of different things. So I think that, you know, we, we have to look at these ports as nodes of, of power and figure out how we're going to accommodate the rest of the world. Which occupies 4,700 ports that are left. Or yeah, so. exactly. And the spaces between mm. the hinterlands. I have one last question for you. If someone's interested in maritime history or wants to read more, what would be the one thing that you would suggest for them to read? Um, not to be too <laughs> forward, but uh, I think my book gives a fairly good, comprehensive outline of the essential strands of maritime history. This is the sea and civilization. The sea and civilization, the maritime history of the world. And once you've read that, uh, the bibliography and the notes will lead you to a vast literature on particular things. Um, and you could just go to that uh, bibliography and notes without reading the book and uh, see what, what might spark your interest. Uh, there's a great deal of uh, maritime literature out there uh, there's been a great increase, as I think I said earlier, in the amount of maritime history being done. And it really depends on what your, your interest is, both uh, spatially or uh, temporally. Thank you so much, Dr. Payne. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you very much for having me. So this is where we finish this episode of States of Anarchy. Thank you for staying with us till the end. 
I've attached a bunch of readings in the episode description if you're interested in maritime history. And if you have any comments or questions or you want to keep up with the show, then you can follow us at the rate States of Anarchy on Instagram or at the rate Hamsini H on Twitter. You can listen to States of Anarchy on the IVM podcast app or wherever you get your podcast from. We'll be back next Tuesday. Hi, I'm Ronnie Scruella, first generation entrepreneur and co-founder at Upgrad. My podcast Dreaming with Your Eyes Open is a companion podcast to my best-selling book Dream with Your Eyes Open. On this podcast, I talk to Amit Doshi, founder of IVM Podcast about my entrepreneurial journey. I walk you through my successes and failures, mostly my failures, and the lessons that I learned from my experiences, family, and colleagues. What was my first entrepreneurial venture? Why I chose Japanese cartoons over animation cartoons on Hangama? Why did I sell my stake at UTV to Disney? Find out all this and more on the Ronnie Scruella podcast, Dreaming with Your Eyes Open. New episodes out every Tuesday on the IBM Podcasts app, website, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Filter coffee is a fascinating beverage. You need to pick the right beans, blend them in the right proportion, roast them to perfection, and slow brew at the right temperature to get the perfect cup. Which is exactly like great conversations as well. You need to track down the most interesting minds, get them into their zone, and settle down for an unhurried, unscripted chat. And coffee for me is always, always, always best enjoyed with friends. I'm Karthik Nagarajan, and do share my table as I meet some of the most interesting people I know and sit them down for a strong cup of coffee and an even stronger conversation. Join me every Wednesday for a freshly brewed episode. This is not frappe. This is the Filter Coffee Podcast. Podcast.